The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Hello, I'm Deb Nicholson. Uh, we're going to talk about software patents, uh, trolls, and then non-trolls. And I'm going to use that term fairly loosely because we've been seeing some disturbing trends over the last couple of years. Um, so unless you have not been paying any attention, you're aware of the troll problem, right? So um, it's, been, it's been covered pretty thoroughly. And, uh, and there's like, there might be people that are like, well, trolls, you know, like people that like modern day sociopaths that are like, I mean, that's a business model. But most of us are like, yeah, no, uh-uh. Um, so in case you have been hiding under a rock, just to give you like kind of some of the scale of the problem, um, this is from 2011. And most of the numbers when we talk about patent suits and patents granted uh, do this kind of exponential growth. So just imagine whatever that number was in 2011 is now a larger number in 2014. But this is $80 billion, and this is a combination of lawsuit fees, um, lost revenue, lost focus, products that never came to market, so lost shareholder value. There's uh, James Besson, who's at Boston University, has like a complex algorithm that he uses to show just how uh, disgusting and terrible the problem is. And so in 2011, he estimated it at about $80 billion per year. Uh, this is from a, another group, the uh, patent freedom. This is the number of suits involving non-practicing entities. So just like, uh, you know, just like all kinds of folks like to have a, a name that they're called that's usually different than one you might think of. Um, they have a name. They're not, they don't like to be called trolls. Um, I don't care if you respect that or not, but they, so a lot of the academic journals in an effort to seem more professional and a little less nursery school name collie refer to them as non-practicing entities. Or sometimes to be even, to put a finer point on it, they will call them a patent aggression entity. So uh, we've seen in the last couple of years that patent trolls have been increasingly targeting smaller and mid-sized projects and uh, not super small, but like uh, getting at people's customers rather than the makers of technology. So instead of going after like, um, you know, the people that make some kind of CMS, they'll go after the people who are using it and hit them like at a smaller amount. So they're like, oh man, it's almost not even worth calling your IT vendor to see if they know about this already and just to pay it and go away. And, you know, so they'll try and hit them for like five grand or something like that. And so this tactic is being used about 40% of the time where they're like, you don't really know what software you're running, but you're using it, and this seems like sort of a legitimate suit, so it'll cost you more to figure out what's going on, so maybe you'll just pay us. Um, plus, it turns out that trolls are everywhere, like absolutely everywhere. Uh, and in just the past year, it seems like everyone finally noticed, like the NPR did another spot where they you know, went and saw the pile of junk mail. Um, a lot of academics wrote about the problem, not only Colleen Chen and James Besson that I mentioned, uh, the Government Accounting Office, which uh, you may not be aware of this, but there is like one branch of the government that all the other branches hate. Uh, they look at someone's budget and they're like, so this $10 billion a year for invisible planes that we've been giving you for like the last eight years, like, I mean, I understand the irony that I don't see the invisible planes, but like, there don't seem to be any. So they, they, they write studies like this. And so they also kind of looked at the impact of patent aggression entities on American businesses. Uh, the FTC has plans. They've, they've done like 350-page uh, reports on the topic. It's not quite in their wheelhouse. They're supposed to be regulating trade. And a lot of times what they do is try and figure out if something is an unfair monopoly. But because all oh, the trolls are separate and they're all different industries, it doesn't qualify for their, their usual beat. So, but they have just, they've basically wrote 350 page letters to Congress saying like, if you decided that we should do something, we're totally ready, we already did the homework. Congress didn't decide that yet, unfortunately. Although legislation is being talked about. 
Um, one, uh, uh, this is a piece, uh, one of the primary um, nonprofit proponents of this is the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation, and they've been very active on this issue. It's called the Innovation Act. Um, one of the pieces is heightened pleading, and this is, it's kind of, I'm gonna try and unpack these le legal terms. Um, it means that you would have to actually describe what the patent and the claims and the product that you're suing on, on basis of. You couldn't just be like, it seems like you're infringing one of our patents. You would actually have to say, like, what, what patent, what product, what invention. Um, it seems weird that this is not already the case, but <laughs> this is not already the case. Uh, fee shifting, this, uh, this would be super helpful um, for larger defendants that have money to fight a patent suit because then when they win, like when the defendant wins, like Newegg or Red Hat, they would get the money back from the troll or the uh, patent aggression entity. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, discovery abuse, I don't know if we have lawyers, I don't wanna like give you guys, okay, great. So I will just go ahead and talk as if we do not have lawyers in the room. I'm also not a lawyer, just so you know. But discovery abuse, um, this is, discovery is part of a lawsuit. First there's a letter that says like, hey, we're gonna sue you. And then once the case moves forward, you don't settle immediately on the first letter. They send you this thing like, well, in order for us to have the proper information for this lawsuit, you need to provide like 30,000 pages of like BS documents for us. Um, even if like what they only need is like three pages, but it's one of the ways that they make it seem more annoying. Like you get that second letter and you're like, oh my God, you're kidding. 12 years of records on like what we've been using for a Wi-Fi card and every machine, like man, no way. So um, stopping discovery abuse would be like, that you could, you could complain to the judge and be like, uh, 12 year, years of like total BS, like really? And they'd be like, no, 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 okay, only two. Um, if uh, many years ago I worked as an assistant in a law office and like, there's, there's nothing more demoralizing than making seven copies of 30,000 pages of documents that you know no one's gonna read. So we should get rid of this just for humanitarian reasons, so like, you know, so paralegals aren't jumping out of buildings, but um, it would also take a lot of the cost and the sting out of patent suits. Uh, better transparency, so this means disclosing the real party and interest. So if you're like, I'm Steve Corporation, and then I'm gonna open up another uh, company called Tom Corporation, and then I'm gonna sue under the name of Tom, but then I have a contractual deal where like 98% of the proceeds from all the lawsuits go back to Steve, then you would have to disclose that, like if you have a parent company or something like that. And this would be good for companies that care what you think of them, but for companies that are large enough, like maybe Microsoft, to not care what you think of them, like this might not, this might not be a deterrent. Um, limited protection for end users. So there's a, I want to get the, the, there's a term in, uh, in Europe where they call the innocent user defense. So this means if you're a user but not a builder of the software that you would not, you wouldn't get sued. The parent company could come in and say like, oh, uh, hey, how about don't sue our customers, sue us which is fine if you're large enough, again, to take on the lawsuit and do those things. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see, like, some of these are of general utility, some of these are of more utility for larger companies that can, you know, throw a couple of million dollars into, like, a we might get it back bucket for a while. So, that's a little, little different. Mm. So this one actually sounds great. Uh, review the patent at the U.S. Patent and Trade Office while litigation goes on hold. So you send a suit, uh, you know, like, oh, I want to um, sue you under patent, like, 3,472. And, um, and then you're like, oh, uh, well, let's have the USPTO look at that one again. Uh, sadly, this one, not on the table anymore. Somehow, someone, someone got to Congress and convinced them that we didn't need to go to that one. Not sure who. Um, so what does all of this mean for the future? I think in a nutshell, it means if you have money, most of your problems around the patent system may eventually get fixed. May, not definitely, 
because Congress, a little bit of a black box there. Um, but if you don't have money, that uh, only a few of the problems that hit you on the patent system are going to get fixed. Um, so the patent system still has huge problems. Otherwise, I could just stop talking and be like, go home, call your congressperson, we'll be done. Um, not, not so great. So the troll business model is actually pretty lucrative. So um, you would think, like hearing all of these different things about how trolls operate, that most people would be like, that's despicable, right? Like if you heard someone like, they said like, oh yeah, like uh, the other day I saw this story on the news where a little old lady in an alley got her purse stolen. But, uh, you know, and you'd be like, that's terrible. Instead, what we have is practicing entities being like, where do you find the little old ladies? So we're going to talk about that. And honestly, it doesn't matter if it's an actual company or a troll if this is you, because you still are out all the money, right? It just, that's, that's a, that's becomes like a, an academic distinction, correct? So there's a couple ways this has been happening. Uh, practicing entities have been selling their patents to subsidiaries, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's gross. Uh, let me see if I can, I have some numbers for you. Um, so trolls don't have to care about like fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. So companies that are in the same industry aren't supposed to sue each other too deep down the stack. So like telephone companies, like handset companies can't be like, well, yours makes calls and mine makes calls. You know, so they're not supposed to be able to sue each other too far on down the stack. But if you're like, but yours also makes toast, and we thought of toast first. Like, okay, that's not, you know, that doesn't wipe out any competitor. So that's what the Frand doctrine is intended to hit. Um, but what we see is, uh, so Microsoft and Nokia uh, sold patents to a non-practicing subsidiary. Uh, it used to be called Mosaid, and now it's called Conversant. But the, those patents, it's like 2,000 of them. They sold them for about 100 bucks a piece and some, some large percentage of any um, revenue gained from the use of those patents goes back to Microsoft. So this is, uh, you know, these are, these are the kinds of things that are like, well, maybe we don't want to put our own name on it and we just want to like let some, a subsidiary monetize that. The thing about uh, Conversant, this particular subsidiary, is that they're, they're incorporated in West Texas, which is where all the patent lawsuits happen in the U.S. That um, I found out recently that 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 that, that uh, particular district as a whole has like a, a average juror age of like 70. So it's it's not a, and I don't mean that to be ages, but like it's it's never been a tech center. So there's like a, a lot of folks that don't really. They're like. That computer, it sounded really complicated. I'm sure you worked very hard. You know, so it's, that's why that district is kind of coveted and then they have, uh, they now have uh, lawyers there that are primed to take advantage of that district's uh, strengths. Um, so Conversant is, uh, is, in, is incorporated there, but also uh, they're opening an office in Ottawa. So they're looking to bring this troll business model to Canada and then also to Europe, so they're opening an office in Luxembourg, which I'm told is the Delaware of Europe. It's kind of super easy to incorporate there. Anyway, so, so that's, that's kind of what, hap what is happening. They're like, oh, we've got this great thing going on in the U.S. where we, like, you know, we go and get special pieces of paper from the U.S. PTO and then we use them to make money. Like, let's see if we can export that. So, so that's like one way, and some of them are getting their patents from uh, real companies. Uh, so you see that, you see anti-competitive suits where people nuisancely sue their competitor, not because they truly believe that they're infringing their patent, but because they know it will just be a pain in the butt for them. Um, and then uh, you see like usually larger companies sort of sending these cross-licensing requests to smaller competitors. And, and when I say request, like it's kind of like, you know, the first one's going to be a request, the second one's going to be a lawsuit. So, you know, it depends on where, you know, how much, do they want easy money or do they want slightly harder, bigger money? So, um, 
Another place that we've been seeing this blurred line between uh, practicing entities and non-practicing entities is universities. They do research, they produce patents, and they also happen to almost always need money. So, uh, so you know, it's, it's this, uh, if, if you have no morals, it's a win-win. Um, but, you know, so we see like Intellectual Ventures has relationships with approximately 300 universities worldwide. And those are only the ones that we could find uh, mention of. Uh, for folks who don't know, Intellectual Ventures is sort of like what all the other patent trolls want to be when they grow up. Um, so they're, they're, they have like something like f at least 40,000 patents in the US, maybe more. They, it's like, 300 different shell corporations, like a constant moving target, um, headed up by Nathan Mervold. So, uh, so Intellectual Ventures is, is huge and global and has these schools like basically making more patents for them to go back and monetize on the rest of us. So you think you're looking at schools and practicing entities and businesses, but I'll, actually they're all turning into patent trolls. They look, they, they, you can't tell the difference anymore. They are walking among us. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's, that's a little different because I think um, from a policy perspective, when we think about like, well, what should we do? And, and Congress is very focused on the troll problem and, and NPR has been talking about the troll problem. And then like that, you know, as, as Americans, like we get really upset and we're like, there are people getting money for not doing work. I'm working. I'm not into that. So, like, you know, people get very really upset about that. You know, unless they're children or something. But, you know, so the with all the focus on the troll problem, we're kind of missing this fuzzy line where, like, you know, they're turning into our schools and our businesses, but they're still doing troll things. So, what do we do about that, right? Well, let's see. Um, now for a tiny bit of good news. Uh, the US court system has been slightly more clueful uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, in New York State, so this is state level. It doesn't necessarily apply to anything that happens in any other state. But there was this uh, MPHJ, and I actually couldn't find what that stood for, technology licensing. Uh, but they were ordered to repay all of their money from their suits. They sent out a ton of letters to a ton of different companies in New York, not saying what they were suing them on, but saying, like, it seems like you're infringing on one of our patents that we won't name or give you the title of or, or like, anything. And they're like, all right. So the, the court in New York State said, um, you actually have to make a serious good faith effort <laughs> to figure out if, you, if the patent you hold actually pertains to the business that you're suing. Like, you can't just send letters to people, which seems like, well, that should have already been the case, but that's not. Um, and then made them give all the money back, which is the real, like, OK, wow, go New York, right? Um, so you know, we may see some more local smacking down, but this is not the case. Like, they're not. The way the court system is, is that um, the rest of the states don't have to pay any attention to what's happening in New York. So that just means that trolls will probably avoid New York for a while. Um, this case, which was decided uh, earlier this month, Akamai versus Limelight. Uh, Akamai said that Limelight and its users are together creating a process that infringes on a patent that we hold, which is kind of like, wait, so over here we've provided software and then over here the users have decided to do something with it. And because you think that whole process is something that you hold a patent on, that, uh, that Limelight should pay you. Uh, this, just to put it mildly, like, it, it is completely the wrong direction. Instead of narrowing the scope of what we consider patentable or infringement, it would just kind of open it up. Like, you know, especially with free software where it kind of says right in there, you can do anything you want with it, right? Um, so a lot of, uh, like, EFF did a, an amicus, like, friend of the court brief, EFF did, uh, Red Hat, like, a ton. And, um, and the court finally said earlier this week, or earlier this month, 
Uh, no, there is no such thing as contributory infringement where two parties together do a thing that is infringement. So that's good. So it doesn't really affect any of the single infringement cases that they have, there, there are zillions of, but it does say like, no, we're not gonna take this new type of infringement that Akamai invented, uh, which is good. Um, Biosig versus Nautilus, uh, this one is, um, it's kind of, it's, it's, two, it's two companies that have a heart rate monitor on exercise equipment. Um, and, uh, and this one is just of, of interest because uh, they struck down the patent because they said it wasn't clear enough. Um, you know, but then, and also that like maybe it might have also been obvious. So it's kind of, it's this thing where uh, the patent said, we put the heart rate monitor where your hand is. But the hand is the place where you read the heart rate, and then the part of the infringement that was alleged was that it was hand-sized, which for something that you use with your hand is sort of obvious, like why would you make it foot-sized if you're gonna put your hand on it? I don't know. But so the, the court basically says like, you, you can't sue someone for making a hand-sized hand thing because it was supposed to always be for the hand, duh. So, um, that was uh, too indefinite, and then also with like a side of obvious. Uh, so that the, so they you know you, just to kind of paint this picture of the court basically being like you know I actually did read this one and decided no that's silly. Um, Sovereign versus Newing. This is one that the uh, Supreme Court was asked to hear, and so. Um, this one, uh, Sovereign sued Newegg for infringing its shopping cart patents. And uh, so Sovereign won in Texas and then lost at the federal circuit level. level. And then, uh, then they appealed again and were like, wait, 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 Sovereign's like, but our shopping cart patents. And the Supreme Court was like, no, no. We're, we're fine with the way the federal circuit left that as like, uh, no, it's too, it's too obvious. You, we're not gonna we're not gonna revisit that for you. Um, this is a quote from the owner of Sovereign. She said it's a really tough time to be a patent owner. Um, and this is just to keep in mind. This is like a, a patent that was filed in 1994 and and published in 1998. So like you know it's got maybe like another six months of life on it anyway. And she was hoping to squeeze out a couple more dollars. You know. So I couldn't find any violins, but. Um, for, uh, for the CEO of Sovereign. But, um, and then the, the new one, um, so this, is, this actually marks like the second year in a row that I've showed up at the Southeast Linux Fest and like there's been some giant news on the software patent front like within two days of my arrival. <laughs> um, last year it was that Obama guy had like a ton to say and you know, it was like a little people kind of wanted to know like how does that affect things. I'm like, yeah, the president of the United States, I should probably in include that like three pages worth of initiatives. This is another thing from the Supreme Court. Um, the Alice versus CLS Bank, um, this is basically a, a financial thing where you have two parties doing business and then you have a third party that kind of acts as a referee or intermediary to make sure that like, this is being counted correctly and being paid for correctly. It's not, it is definitely not rocket science. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the, the reason that it got so far was that it was like surrounded by all this language that is basically, but the intermediary is on a computer. It's like, oh, whoa, oh, high tech, like, okay, well, you know. So it got through the system where they're like, you know, oh, okay. And so finally the Supreme Court said like, you can't take something that's super obvious and then just put it on a general purpose computer. Like that's no longer okay. There is no more magical patentability for it is on a computer, which is great. Uh, it's not quite enough. Like I, I, I don't wanna crush the good news quite so quickly. This is what we call like a, a 101. So it's like non, it's not patentable subject matter to take something that people already do regularly that's like an abstract idea or like a part of nature and then just add, uh, and then you do some stuff to it on a general purpose computer. 
they did kind of look into it and they're like, maybe they sort of left the door open, like maybe if it's a, like an extra special computer or it has like a hardware component. One of the um, famous cases is uh, Diamond versus Deer, and this has uh, kind of created some of the precedent for um, software and hardware working together, creating a patentable idea. Um, it's a company that makes uh, that makes tires. And so they had software that controlled like extremely specialized hardware that interacts with tires. And so that's, you know, that seems like, yeah, okay, a lot of that is the hardware. Um, but a lot of the software cases and the precedences that we've seen from that um, somehow lost the hardware idea. They were like, well, I mean, this computer seems pretty special. Okay. But uh, the Supreme Court has said like, you, you can't do like just general stuff on a general purpose computer. But they left the door open for if you do special stuff on a general purpose computer or if you do general stuff on a special computer that might still be patentable. If that, and those are, that's kind of like in the 102 or the, or the 103, that's another piece of the, uh, the law that describes like what you can and cannot have a patent on. So it's kind of like, maybe you can think of it as like one down, two to go. In, in, in broad strokes, um, you know, who knows if the Supreme Court counts uh, their points the same way that we count their points. I kind of was wondering the other day, like, you know, if you, uh, if you act in a play, like you go and you read the, you know, what the reviewers had to say the next day, and I, I wonder if, like, the Supremes go and look at Pat and Leo or, you know, Ars Technica or Tech Dirt to be like, I wonder how they thought that brief went. Like, probably not. They, maybe they don't have time for that, but they would learn a lot if they did. Um, so all of that is to say that, so we've had some good news, but predators may not be stopped. Um, so we, there is still some work to do and some things to think about. Um, so what can we do? Um, we could ignore it and wait to get eaten by the velociraptor thing. Or uh, we could look at some community solutions and then uh, working on some policy stuff ourselves. So we'll take those each separately. Uh, one of the community solutions, so I work at the Open Invention Network. We run a non-aggression pack for Linux, GNU, Android, and a lot of free and open source software tools. Um, basically, we got like 800 companies to sign this thing saying that they wouldn't sue any of the other 800 companies in, the, in, the, in this area. And that they would provide a free cross license for each of their own patents in that area. Um, so that, you know, takes the amount of suing down a, a good notch, which is, which is important. Um, when we started, we had like, you know, uh, six companies. So now we're at 800. So that's a lot less companies that will sue you if you sign on. Um, we also have a defensive patent pool where we maintain patents. Uh, and there are people looking at doing these for other areas. We just happen to be the group that's doing it for the GNU Linux Android development tools area. Um, but this is basically like figuring out strategic patents so that if you got sued from outside the community, could you counter sue and with what? Um, use the GPL, uh, which has a patent clause. This means if you write something or Apache, like, you know, I happen to be a, fam a fan of the GPL, but um, using a modern patent, uh, a modern license that mentions patents that says like, you can use my code for any purpose but you cannot come back and sue me for patent infringement on the code that I gave you. So, um, and that's not the legal definition, but that's, that's the import. And the, and the Apache license says this too. The DPL is coming out this year. I, we'll see, it's, it's still a few months away. It's kind of in beta, but this is basically like, if you have patents, you could attach a license to them saying, like, you can use this as long as you don't sue me. It's a little bit more general. Um, We'll see how that comes out when it's like ready for prime time. Um, and then you could also lobby for software specific reforms to your local patent regime. Um, or, or at least call that person that claims to represent you down in Congress, you know, occasionally. Uh, so each, each patent system has its own challenges, different countries like, um, you know, I, I talk about this when I go outside the US and like I, I use, and they're like, Basically, I get some version of like, why are you guys so crazy? I'm like, oh, I don't know. But um, we have, uh, there, are, um, there are folks in the US like specifically working towards bringing 
other countries into harmonization with our patent regime. Anytime you hear the word harmonization, you, you know that person is not in your best interest. Like they are, they're, they've used a giant fancy word to be like, why don't you be more like I want you to? Which is almost never good for you. So, uh, so we've been seeing like uh, the US like sort of leveraging IP policy against physical trade policy. And we're apparently one of the only countries that does this. Um, so, you know, like Australia has a ton of kangaroo meat or bauxite or whatever it is they have there to sell. And, and the US is like, gosh, it sure would be a shame if all that kangaroo meat went rotting or something. Um, but we could take a lot of it off your hands if you were to harmonize with us on IP policy. So, um, so it's, it's not just random when countries decide to change or uh, you know, come closer to the US on their IP policy. There's an actual initiative underway to make that happen. Uh, so going back to the US like specific where we may have some power to change things, um, we, could, we could push for complete transparency when the suits are brought. I think that piece of the Innovation Act is great um, and helps up and down the board. Uh, I think going at, like, the, you know, legislatively, the way that the patent system works at its root and not just kind of talking about what you can sue on, what you can't sue on, but much shorter lifespans for software patents, like two years maybe, something like that would be a little bit closer. And, I, and I'm arguing for this specific to software. Like, uh, I think we have plenty of, of software patent holders to take on while we consider reform in this area without also pissing off big pharma. Um, so I don't recommend, you know, like work on those separate. <laughs> um, Eliminating functional claiming by requiring less fuzziness in patent applications. So fuzziness is not a legal term, but functional claiming is. Um, functional claiming means that you, uh, you don't say like, I thought of an idea that needs a solution. And that's kind of what you get a patent for now. So you, say, you go to the USPTO and you say like, I thought of this, I, I found this problem, and, um, and I would like to fix it using software. And the USPTO says like, okay, um, we'll produce 30 pages of verbiage and some charts and we'll do that. We'll give you that. Um, but functional claiming says you actually have to say how you will fix the problem. That you can't just say software is how you will fix the problem. That's how it used to be. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, we, we, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, there are some other problems with the USPTO, which we'll talk about. Uh, one is that we sort of financially incentivize the patent office to offer patents. Um, so they, they get a certain amount of fees for uh, looking at an application, and then they get more fees for actually granting a patent application. So they're sort of always working on your team to help you get the patent. Because they know government jobs, there's always cutbacks, there's always budget cuts, like, you know, they, it, it doesn't take a, a super genius to understand that the more money that comes in, the more of us are likely to keep our jobs. So financially incentivizing the patent office is, is not a great plan. Uh, some of the individual activities that we might uh, consider, I just wanted to see how we are on time. I wanted to leave time for questions, so. Um, help with patent busting. We have, uh, we do some of that at Linux Defenders. Um, and I'll give you guys some links for some of the places where you can look at patents that are going to be granted or have already been granted and are under review for some reason or other. Tell your lawmakers why this matters to you. I think that, um, so for, like, I, I have parents who are like, you do that tech thing, I don't really know what it is, but we're proud of you because it seems like they consistently pay you and stuff. And, you know, so it's like, you know, and occasionally, like, I got the, like, oh, I just saw this thing on NPR. Is that, do you do that? I'm like, yeah, kind of, okay. But I think for most of the folks who didn't come to spend their weekend at a Linux Fest, uh, software patents are this thing that, like, giant companies like Sony and Apple and Google and Microsoft fight over. And they don't, you know, it's kind of like, it's sort of hard to drum up a lot of uh, sympathy, like, 
Oh man, Microsoft is losing, what, is it six million or 10 million? I don't know, but a lot, right? Like, no one cares. Like, that's not, that doesn't really pull the heartstrings of the American people to like get something done on this terrible problem. So, uh, you know, the, but the smaller companies don't get a lot of press. So I think, you know, talking to folks about like, this is not only like two ginormous companies that have several billion dollars to use to fight each other in a public way. This is affecting smaller and mid-sized companies. This is making it harder for us to get people to use free software because we can't say like, well, if anyone sues you, like, just let us know and we'll handle it, you know. So if, you're co if that does not describe your company, then, um, you know, then you, you see where this is an unfair uh, disadvantage. Um, so, and talking to your colleagues and friends about uh, anti-competitive behavior, it's not only trolls, although the trolls are hilarious. Um, I mentioned Nathan Mervold before. Uh, this is a man who, uh, Intellectual Ventures has so many shell corporations. Uh, he sits on the board, I think, of uh, Disney, or one of the, like one of the entertainment, uh, one of the entertainment companies, and a piece of intellectual ventures actually sued this company that he sits on the board of. So a journalist noticed this and was like, huh, that's really funny. It's like intellectual ventures, like Nathan Mervold sued himself. And he wrote about it like, huh. And then that company was quietly dropped from the list of defendants. So. Oh, I mean, I don't know, like Nathan Merville doesn't call me up, I don't get invited to these meetings, but it seems like he did sue himself and then didn't notice until it was called out by a journalist. So, you know, so the troll stories are hilarious and ridiculous and like, you know, everyone's ready to get the pitchforks together and go down and figure out where he lives or whatever, I'm not advocating that. Um, I don't own a pitchfork, I'm a city gal. But uh, you know, letting them know that it's, it's not always that. Sometimes it's the less, uh, you know, the less stark black and white kind of story. It's like a, a larger company suing a slightly smaller competitor. Um, I, I don't know if uh, anyone has seen the readers that folks who are visually impaired use for using their computer. There's two companies that do that. Um, the slightly larger ones sued the smaller one and uh, because they wanted the whole market. And so what happened was that the larger one lost, but, and, and they both still exist or whatever, but um, over the three to four years that this lawsuit went on, neither company produced any new features. Um, and in case you were wondering who pays for software for people with visual impairments, it's not people with visual impairments, it's the government, the state government in most places, because they want to help those people become employable and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, so the cost of the software goes up. As taxpayers, we take that on. Um, people with visual impairments didn't win because there was no improvements to their software. Um, but almost no one knows this outside of the community of people with visual impairments. So, yeah. And also, that software Oh, yeah, so, well, and that's, and so, like, and the only check they have is that there's two companies. Like, one company has many more contracts, but uh, that one was like, we could probably charge three times as much if we could just needle out this one competitor that is keeping us as close to reasonable as we already aren't, you know. So, anyway, so there's, like, so there's the, the, the predators. It's not only, you know, it's not only the Googles and the Microsofts, and it's not only the trolls. Um, so what we know about the general public's attention span is, uh, yeah. Um, so you know, while people are talking about patent trolls and patent reform, uh, the movement is, is hot. Um, and what we know about practicing entities is that uh, they, they, might, they might spin it off into a subsidiary with like a name that doesn't make any sense or sound like it actually does anything and then incorporate in Ottawa, but they're still coming for you. Um, so picture credits and these are the patent busting sites that I mentioned before. So um, Linux Defenders, that's the one that we run at OIN. This is specific to Linux stuff and, you know, well, Linux operating systems, so GNU, Android, et cetera. Um, trolling Effects is the one run by EFF. So that's a little bit more general on, uh, you know, all kinds of software. And then patents at Stack Exchange, where they are looking at patents there. So, um, 
they're doing, you know, sometimes people are sourcing prior art, which uh, shows that a, a software patent that's being considered isn't new or wasn't new at the time it was granted. Sometimes they're uh, looking to overturn something or find some, um, you know, some evidence that it was obvious when it was granted or uh, is obvious before it gets granted. And then if you do want to read a little bit, um, a lot of these, a lot of the academic papers tend to be pretty dense, but uh, Colleen Chen does a really good job. She worked with um, the New America Foundation to put this publication out last year, and it's very readable. So if you, if you want more, if you are having, you know, you're sleeping too much, sleeping too well, and you want to, you know, have more statistics to keep you up, um, this paper is pretty great. So I am willing to take your questions now. Thanks. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the GPL has a uh, version three. Sorry. Okay, GPL three. Uh, has a stipulation about not being sued or proposed that you contributed. Uh, I'm assuming the ESP license is not. No, uh, it does not. The Apache license has a has a similar clause, which I'm a little less familiar with, I'll admit. But uh, the BSD uh, license hasn't changed. So. GPLv2 doesn't mention patents because at the time that v2 was written, I think 1992, um, we didn't have this problem or we didn't know, we didn't see it coming yet. So there's no mention of patents in GPLv2. Um, BSD hasn't changed in a long time and so it definitely, and it's only the three clauses, it doesn't mention anything about patents. Yeah, I mean that's, with some caveats, like, you know, if, uh, I mean, anyone can send you a letter and say they'll sue you, but you're, it, like, so there's kind of two questions there, like, could someone sue you? Like, someone can always send you a letter and be like, I sue you for unicorn harboring, like, all right. Um, and then if you can't take it to court, like, you give them money for harboring unicorns. Uh, but the, the second question is, if you go to court, will the co is the court likely to be able to rule for you or for the uh, person bringing the suit? So BSD has nothing in it that says, I wrote this and didn't intend for it to be patented. Like, the courts haven't tried this yet. So there is the, the second case we don't know about. Like, we don't know how that will play out. Um, the hope by the folks who worked on the most recent version of the Apache license and the most recent version of GPL is that it would act as a deterrent to um, people using your code and then patenting the functionality. Does that, it's tricky because copyright law and patent law are separate. Copyright is supposed to be on the written stuff and patent is supposed to be on the functionality. So like a, a program has both a function and actual text within it. And so the way that those two pieces, uh, two bodies of law interact is uh, messy <laughs> and not totally, uh, until it goes to court, we don't know how all of the edge cases would play out. So that's why my answer is like, well, maybe, or could be, and hopefully. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, and we just talked about this on the way in, and I haven't, I haven't looked into that one so closely. I do think, um, so the previous, the situation like a year ago was where uh, the Supreme Court says like, uh, in the, in, a, in another case, like their batch of cases from last year basically kind of said like, hey, you can't like, they tried to slightly narrow the scope of patentability, and the, the West Texas court immediately was like, you know, took this sort of Clintonian like, well you said is, but I think you don't mean is here, I think you mean is, and so we're gonna go ahead and basically do what we want with this like long verbiage describing like how we were like, we're actually on this side of the new line instead of on this side because we've decided to interpret your stuff this way. So I think it seemed like there was no way to be like, hey, that's not what I said. Like so, we may be starting to see some, um, you know, some effort to keep the lower courts in line with the precedences laid down by the upper courts. But um, it, uh, uh, aside from that being like, that sounds like the right direction. I, I, I couldn't say too much more. 
but yeah, and that's when I, I ended up looking at this one mostly before I got here, the Alice case, so. Do people, yeah. Yeah, Newegg uh, tried to sue them back. So, like, uh, if you, like, when you try and go sovereign versus Newegg, you get a bunch of Newegg versus sovereign results. Um, and I'm trying to let me see if I can find that. There's Is like, still in progress? no, I think that uh, I think it's oh oh the Newegg's the countersuit. Um, the countersuit may actually still be in progress, but the sovereign versus Newegg case um, has has been denied appeal. Uh, so I don't know if I don't know if Newegg's going to get money back from them or not, um, but yeah, that was it was um, you know, and, and Newegg has a couple of those countersuits in the fire, I think, actually. Yeah, well, and I think that's because the CEO at Newegg, whose name I'm blanking on, but he did a TED talk on like if you have the money fight them because it's it like we all know it's a bunch of ridiculous stuff when you get like a troll suit like this um, and so yeah he's I think he went looking for a lawyer who was like oh yeah let me at them so I think that that worked out that works out great for everyone right so Oh, I don't remember seeing anything about a Kickstarter. I, my impression was that the Newegg one was doing his own money, but it might, that could be a different case. He's, Newegg's fought a couple of trolls, like, and so it might not be this one. Yeah, oh, I'd like to see that. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember how that one came out. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a uh, I mean so the the kinds of money you can raise on Kickstarter like generally don't get into the same like kind of stratospheric level of the cost of lawsuits. Um Yeah, especially if you're going to fight a bunch of that, you know, and it's like uh, yeah, so the FSF had a uh, earmarked donation fund for a while on fighting patent suits, but um, you know the amount in there was like that'd be like a, a third of a lawsuit. You know, I mean that you know I don't think they've pushed that recently because it's uh, the kind of working on the policy end as opposed to trying to be a legal defense fund. But um, it's it's uh, the amounts you need to raise for a lawsuit defense fund is is pretty intense. So the, the patents at Stack Exchange, um, people will add information that they think is relevant to specific stuff. Um, but that uh, most of them tend to focus on uh, uh, patents that are pending and uh, like have not yet been granted. The, the process, it becomes more difficult to uh, challenge an already existing patent. Um, although uh, we do know, um, Red Hat and Novell were sued by um, a troll that had picked up a couple of old Xerox Park patents, and they decided like it was on X Windows. They were, they were like, oh, that whole like window display object thing, you know, how they're box shaped, which is, you know, because everything on the computer is box shaped uh, except a Mac. But um, anyway, so like they, you know, they got this. It was like a trio of X Windows patents, and you know. Uh, they decided to crowdsource stuff. So I'm trying to remember the precise dates. I think it was something like patents were granted in 89. And then um, because of who Red Hat is and who's part of their community, they were able to find the folks who had archived the Usenix lists from 87 and 88. 
and, uh, and rustle up some prior art to say like, yeah, actually when those Xerox Park patents were granted, they, it wasn't new. We were all using boxes for window display objects or whatever already. So that tree of patents was overturned. But it was like part of a lawsuit. So the whole, you know, the whole cost of a lawsuit had to be laid out to, in order to turn over those patents. So most of the patent busting tends to focus on new stuff because you don't have to hire a lawyer to do it. You just kind of get someone who's a little bit savvy enough to help you write a defensive publication. Um, and then you submit that prior art to the US Patent and Trade Office so that they can, uh, they kind of know what to look at. That's, Kind of the, the huge problem with the US Patent and Trade Office um, is that they don't really know where to look. Like, if you, for a more traditional field that's like a physical or mechanical stuff, you, you know, you subscribe to the three journals that cover your area and you, and you just read them and then you know what's new and what's not new. But for software, it's like, well, you know, maybe like 12 different repositories. Uh, you know, 1,800 worldwide conferences where people might be talking about stuff. And, you know, so it's kind of just a million grains of sand to look at. And so, um, so the prior art uh, work is in order to sort of put that into a place where it has the keywords that the US Patent and Trade Office is looking for so that they can figure out what is new and what's not actually new. Does that? kind of answer that. Anything else? Comments? Pitchforks? I don't know. <laughs> cool. Um, OK. I finished a little early. Uh, just, oh, only 10 minutes. Um, I, uh, oh, I still have this from the, I was at Linux Fest Northwest. But I, I wear many hats. So this is one of the other ones. We opened our call for papers today. So um, OK. Thanks so much for coming in. Oh, do you have another? It's British. Well, the United States. Okay. The oh, United okay. States one was it's actually not the cell phone patent. It was a it was AT and T. Uh, they were set you like you did in Unix, and they had a way that they had a hardware scheme where there was actually going to be a hardware that they could live for it. They never built that part, but and, and then it just somebody forgot about that part, and somehow the next thing you know, it was like okay to have software. It's actually a little bit more complicated, and um, I uh, because we had so much we had so much stuff going on with the legislature and with the courts this year. Like I focused really a lot on that, but um, it was actually sort of a slow like it was a slow like twenty some years of general or uh, what do you call it rationalizations like towards like from like oh well you know machines that do things and then like the machines that have software on them and do things and then you know so it was like kind of this slow descent into uh i guess anything on a computer because they seem really complicated you could have a patent for so um i could show you some stuff uh offline from another presentation that uh kind of goes through it was a uh, started in the 70s with a like, oh, well, we don't know if this will apply to anything. And then they applied this old precedent to like new stuff. And, you know, it kind of becomes, um, it was just a slow kind of descent. And then um, I think it was like in the 80s, all of a sudden, uh, one of the cases which I'm blanking on, like just kind of opened the floodgates. And so then like all through the 90s, you just see a zillion patents on software. So. But yeah, I could, I could talk with you more about the history later if you want. But OK, cool. Well, thanks a lot, you guys. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis?
Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.